So today we've got Charlie all the way from Amsterdam, a fellow creative technologist who many of you may know as DevDevCharlie over on Twitter. And Charlie's been making some amazing work with TensorFlow.js that keeps popping up in my feed. So I wanted to invite her to talk about some of that today, including her Fruit Ninja uh, experiment and a system that can detect running water to ensure you're washing your hands properly in the current times. So with that, Charlie, tell us more about yourself and what you've created. Um, so hi, I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm currently a senior front-end developer at Netlify. And on the side, I also do a lot of um, creative projects with technology and uh, human-computer interaction to kind of find new ways to interact with uh, interfaces uh, in JavaScript mostly. So this is where I use um, TensorFlow.js a lot. So uh, in terms of the two projects that I've um, that I've built, uh, the Fruit Ninja clone or prototype is a web experiment that uses TensorFlow.js to play a game of Fruit Ninja in the browser, but with hand movements. So not using your trackpad. No touch screen, uh, as you would usually expect, but it mixes motion tracking and 3D in the browser and collision detection as well. So the goal of the game is to slice some fruits and avoid uh, the bombs, but I basically wanted to experiment with making this game more uh, interactive. Uh, and when it comes to the water detection prototype, uh, it's a project that I wanted to build after um, Apple announced that they were releasing a new version of their Apple Watch OS that included a water detection um, uh, app that was uh, triggering a countdown to help ensure that people were washing their hands for 20 seconds. And I uh, only wanted to rebuild the same thing, but in, in JavaScript to kind of show the possibilities of uh, TensorFlow.js. Super cool. I mean, these are both really cool projects. And I know there was a lot of people looking at your very carefully perched MacBook on the side <laughs> of the water demo there. People were quite worried about the MacBook going in the water there. But um, I'd love to see them in action. Could you show us some of these? Um, so the, this water um, detection project that I called WashOS, uh -huh, uh, it uses a, a model a train using the Teachable Machine platform. So uh, I wanted to be able to build a prototype quite quickly, like in a few, uh, not even in a few hours, but I recorded samples of audio of water running uh, in, my in my kitchen. And I used uh, transfer learning on the speech commands model that I then downloaded um, in, like I downloaded the model that was retrained to use it in my application. So um, I have a counter interface that uses the, the laptop's microphone to listen to sounds in the environment. And when it detects that what is going on around matches um, what the, the sound that I trained um, in Teachable Machine, so running water, it triggers the countdown from 20 to, to 0. So the main goal of this project was to show that you can build experiments at home without having to work um, at Apple or without having to know that much about machine learning. Uh, and one of the challenges with using this model is that it can only recognize a single sound at a time. So you have to take that into consideration when you, when you build your project. So Teachable Machine is a great tool for like making things pretty fast for prototyping. And I'm just curious, like, how many sound samples did you need to get reasonable results for this project? So I was also concerned about uh, wasting water. So I only recorded the amount of samples that were uh, the minimum required. So I think it's about like eight, eight samples of two okay. seconds. Yeah, that's pretty so cool. I only yeah. trained the model um, twice um, just to be sure that I could get some like a good accuracy. But I also didn't want to waste too much water and it was a prototype. So I used the minimum, but you can definitely uh, record a lot more if you want more accuracy. Certainly. Very cool. Um, and then on to the second demo. So uh, this Fruit Ninja uh, clone was a bit more complicated because it took uh, it took longer to build because it incorporated more things. It wasn't only TensorFlow.js, it was also um, 3.js and it had to uh, do a bit of collision detection. But I started by implementing uh, the pose detection uh, to track my hands and have the, the location of my hands mapped to coordinates on the screen. Uh, but then I decided to build the game in 3D. So I used um, 3GS and I had to figure out how to map the 2D coordinates given by TensorFlow.js to 3D coordinates uh, in, in the 3GS scene. And so as the game relies on collision detection, uh, it had to detect when the coordinates of my hands were clashing with the 3D models, so either the fruits and, or the bomb. Uh, and all of this happened in a 3D scene that has a different coordinate system. So I had to do some research and a lot of experimentation to get there. But once I managed to translate uh, the 2D coordinates to 3D, I implemented what is called uh, ray casting, to cast a ray between the hand and the 3D object to be able to detect um, collision and then either increase the points or make the player uh, lose. But um, it was more challenging, but it was really, really interesting. 
That's super cool. And it's interesting that you had to transform coordinate systems there to get the, the model playing nice with 3.js and this kind of stuff. I think I saw some similar things with people doing things with face mesh to understand the 3D face onto a 3D mesh and all this kind of stuff too. So um, these kinds of tools and uh, libraries that enable that will be super useful in the future as well, I'm sure. Now, whilst we're talking about models, <laughs> I've got to ask, because maybe my team is watching uh, later on, um, what machine learning models would you love to see in the future that might be really helpful to you in your creative uh, process? Um, so there's two things that I could think of, but one of them is just like a, an improvement to a model. It's like I've been using HandPose the hand pose model um, in one of my experiments. And I think at the moment it can only detect one hand at a time. And I think I saw a line that was saying that the detection of both hands is going to come soon. And I'm really looking forward to it because I would love to be able to interact with interfaces with both hands. Um, but another one, another thing that I was thinking of that I would love, but I don't know if it's possible. Uh, it's to it's a model that would recognize a sequence of movements, not only because if you uh, try teachable machine, you record one image at a time and the model uh, tries to recognize a pattern in images. But I would love a model that can um, that can track movements, not only just my hand is on the right, but that I'm doing a sequence of movement that can re be repeated. So I've been experimenting with that with hardware, but I'd love to be able to do that in the browser with the camera, uh, if possible, because then you could build a lot of experiments with this. That's, yeah, that's really useful feedback, actually. I guess, yeah, the gesture, the act of a gesture. So if you're like moving your hand in a certain way, you got that time frame yes. that uh, uh, you're seeing those frames come together in a certain in a certain way. And that, that actually is something I believe you can do with Cloud AutoML right now. Um, and hopefully we can get back to export to TensorFlow.js or yes. something. That would be nice. <laughs> uh, no promises, but I should definitely pass on the feedback to the team and see where that goes. And then hand pose, yeah, having two hands makes complete sense. I think even I also gave a poke about that the other day. So <laughs> hopefully nice. we'll see that come through in the future as well. Cool. So. Next up, I guess, let's talk about these demos. Are they hosted somewhere? Um, can people go play with this right now? I'm sure people watching this want to go play with the Fruit Ninja and also, of course, to try out the taps with their laptops perched on the edge of the desks and all this kind of stuff. So um, how can they do that? Um, so I host most of my demos on uh, on Netlify. So the Fruit Ninja uh, game is on, I think, splat.netlify.app. And uh, WashOS is on wash-os.netlify.app. But otherwise, all the code is always uh, open source on GitHub. Uh, I want people to get into this space. So usually all the repos are public. And if people want to have a look at the code, they, they can. Yeah, we'll put the links in the description after the show so people can click on those. So do check out the description uh, later on. Um, so I also want to ask you a little bit about what inspires you to make these creative ideas. Now, you know, I personally um, look for problems in my life and then I try and fix them and usually that ends up being popular with other people. But I'm just curious, as a fellow creative, what, what kind of pattern or approach do you use when you come up with these ideas? I think I probably do a bit of the of the same thing. I take inspiration from what's uh, around me. I think it'd be random. It doesn't have to be tech related. At first, sometimes I can go for a walk and then look at something and think, oh, how could I augment that with technology? Or uh, how could I change it to make it more interactive? That's, for example, what I did with the, uh, the Fruit Ninja game. It's like, what if I don't want to use my phone? Or what if I don't like joysticks and I want it to be more free? Um, so it's usually the process that I that I take. I read uh, research papers, for example, of around human computer uh, interaction, and I try to think how can I bring that to the web. Awesome, yeah, and I think the web is a great platform for prototyping, experimenting, and allowing everyone else to try it out afterwards. Of course, so that's always great. So we've got a lot of people from very diverse backgrounds watching today. Uh, do you have any advice for people wanting to take their first steps to make creative prototypes like this? Um, I would always advise to start small and to not be scared to uh, reproduce something that, you, that you've seen around and that excites you. I think uh, sometimes when people ask me exactly the same question, they, they expect to have an idea that has never been done before, before they start looking into that. And that is very rare. Um, so I would usually advise to, if, there's, if, if you came across a project that excites you, there's a reason why it excites you and you will definitely keep going and keep learning if, if you do something that you're uh, interested in. A lot of my experiments start exactly that way. Uh, I'm inspired by something that I see, uh, either in tech or in other fields or done in other languages. And I try to reproduce that and add my touch to it. It's like, oh, now that I figured out how this works, how can I add something uh, onto it? And so you don't have to follow a tutorial if, if the project 
is not something that interests you, but find something that you're uh, that you're excited about and kind of make it your own. Um, that's one advice that I could think of. Yeah, often the hardest bit is just to get the momentum going, and then you know, as yes. you start adding to it, it just evolves into something beyond what you actually were originally trying to to clone or something. But it becomes your own piece of uh, you know creativity in the end. So that's definitely uh, some good advice there. Um, so with that, thank you very much, Charlie, for joining us today. It's been great having you on the show, and I look forward to seeing what you create in the future. Thank you.